thought I'd kind of set the stage uh, and and talk a little bit about knowledge is not skill um, and the, the whole idea of developing strategic management skills and competencies. Um, before I do that, I thought I'd take a minute and a half and show you a little bit about Marketplace if you've not seen it before. Welcome to Marketplace Simulations. We provide business simulations for undergraduate and graduate college courses. Simulations are digital game-like exercises that give your students the opportunity to learn by doing. Concepts come to life when students make business decisions for themselves and compete against each other in the safety of a virtual environment. Marketplace has been a leader in higher education simulation learning for more than 30 years, currently used in over 600 schools worldwide. In our simulations, students will start up a company breaking into a new market. They'll develop a business strategy, analyze market data, launch products, grow and manage a global business empire. Students test ideas and learn from the results, maximizing the bottom line. Our instructor dashboard is full of tools and resources to support you and your classroom. Set up a new simulation in just a few clicks. Easily assess student performance and monitor decisions real time. Automated grading and world-class support mean you spend more time focusing on your students. With over 30 simulations ranging from marketing to entrepreneurship to strategy and from core to capstone, we have the right one for your course. If you're looking to introduce a business simulation to your classroom, just visit us at MarketplaceSimulations.com. Okay, so I hope that gave you a, a kind of a brief feeling for the software that we have. It's a um, uh, it's called Marketplace Simulations, and uh, you can see the uh, the user interface. It's a very tactical uh, type of simulation, and of course, it's uh, highly strategic. I thought I'd start off with uh, just a, a discussion on knowledge is not skill. Uh, and then tell you a little bit about who Marketplace is. Uh, and then uh, I have in mind that we'll play a few quarters of, of a Marketplace simulation all together and then uh, wrap up with some conclusions and discussion. By all means, feel free to um, ask questions and chat and uh, either Gary Lewis or uh, Kelly Ellenberg or Anna will um, pass those on to me and we can address them. So school is all about developing knowledge. Um, we have, as educators, we have lots of experience with that. But knowledge is not skill. Now, what's the difference between knowledge and skill? All right, knowing what to do versus being able to do it, okay? Um, let's see here, I'm trying to get this off the page. Okay, so how do you achieve uh, the skill level to be among the very best? And uh, uh, it takes lots of practice. So if you, if you think about all the people here and all the people in any profession, to be among the very best, um, it takes a lot of practice. Um, these are just a few examples of playing soccer or football or playing a musical instrument or even doing yoga, meditation, all right? The more practice, the more skills we develop. Um, and how can you enhance the value of practice? A good coach. Um, we saw that in the Olympics, uh, the coach makes all the difference in the world, but it's true in, in any profession to have somebody who can be uh, watching you, guiding you, giving you drills, um, making suggestions, knowing where you have your weak points and where your strong points can change everything. So a coach can potentially reduce the amount of practice needed to achieve the desired skill level, all right? Um, but probably more important is that it can help you achieve a much higher skill level. And uh, probably the most famous coach is Yoda. Uh, and uh, uh, 
coaching Luke Skywalker with regards to uh, uh, the force. Um, we learn by doing just as this little baby will probably or probably did learn to not point a squirt gun at himself and pull the trigger at the same time. Um, they, uh, uh, and I have a four-year-old just turned four and it's absolutely fascinating to watch him learn and, and uh, how he keeps trying to, to do things, do things he sees other people doing, doing things that he's never seen anybody done do before. And, uh, uh, and he's not successful uh, in most cases, but the, uh, he's very tenacious and highly resilient and just keeps trying over and over again. Um, and when he gets it, he'll exclaim, I did it, I did it. Uh, and in education, it's very much the same thing or in business, you know, what we do is we assess the situation try to figure it out um, and how to apply what I know. So like in a business context, you've never been in before or a business simulation, uh, you're trying to understand how you can use your knowledge to, to the best advantage. Um, and then choose the course of action that you think is best and then act on it, okay? Um, and then you find out how it goes. Did it work out the way you expected? Or are there aspects of it that didn't measure up or others that exceeded? So you're always assessing how did it go? And then uh, that leads you to revise your knowledge base. Uh, and, uh, and then you can use that updated information to go back into the market or back into the game or back into whatever. And uh, um, assess again, what's the best course of action uh, or reflect on the best course of action and then act on it um, and reflect. And of course, we repeat this endlessly. Now, when you're young, you're doing it with almost everything you're doing day in and day out. As we get older, we have more experience and we can apply our knowledge with, with greater success. Now, I think there's a corollary to this learning by doing. Uh, so what we know influences what we think. And this is the importance of going to school and studying. So we are giving our students uh, or ourselves greater uh, resources to use. And that influences our attitudes, our values, and our intentions. And what we think determines what we want to do. However, skills determine what we can do, all right? So knowledge is not skill. It's one thing to know what to do, but it's another thing to be able to do it. Now, I, I'm sure you've heard this quote about Thomas Edison. Invention is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Okay, <clears throat> I think we can say the same thing about strategy. It's 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. That's why I really like the, I, the construct of strategic management, all right? You, no matter how much time you take to put together a strategy, it's in the execution. That's the important part. It's the strategic management. And, you know, I can tell you, I have a small company, 20 some employees, and we have a, a number of products, services, and we're located in two countries, and all these things. And strategic management is the order of the day. It's what you have to do constantly. So what kinds of strategic management skills do students practice and develop while participating in a marketplace simulation? So these are all the things that are part and parcel of uh, running a business in a simulated env environment. That's like a business flight simulator. And so these are the things that you're gonna be dealing with or that your students deal with. And it gives you an opportunity to develop your strategic management skills. And it really is the best way to just understand what strategy is, is not the same thing as being able to do it. To be able to analyze cases and figure out what should be done is only part way through that uh, experiential learning cycle that I was showing earlier. You actually have to do it 
and then see how it works because your knowledge is imperfect. And plus you have to learn how to apply it in a, in a particular use situation. So who is Marketplace or what is Marketplace? Um, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of background you may not know. Uh, so we have lots of simulations that last 20 minutes, a few hours, a few weeks, or an entire semester for undergraduates, MBAs, and executives. We cover core courses and all the functional area plus capstone courses. Strategy is a very important part of all of them. Um, students can play at their own pace, like against the computer, and I'll show you that uh, when we do a hands-on exercise. Or you can play against classmates, which is a very invigorating kind of an experience when you're playing against live competitors and you know those people as well. So a marketplace simulation will engage your students, leaving you to do what is uh, coaching. And to me, this is experiential learning at its best. So what I've tried to do with simulations is move away from the idea of instructor. If you think about the meaning of that word or teacher and you become a coach and a coach, just like with any athletic or musical or anything is somebody who is there side by side to help you. And, uh, uh, and that's such a, a wonderful way of being an educator. Now we have lots of simulations. If we think about strategy simulations, here are a number of them that we have. We have others that deal with um, supply chain management, accounting and finance, uh, operations management and so forth. But these are a host of simulations that are related to strategic management. Uh, some of them are at the intro level, intermediate level or advanced. Uh, and a very advanced level um, if you're looking at MBAs and EMBAs. Tell you a little bit about Marketplace uh, is that we have spent more than two years making sure that all students can easily, equally, and independently engage uh, with our simulations. So you may not realize it, but about 20% of the population are challenged in the ways of motor, auditory, cognitive, and visual skills. And uh, there are laws that say we must uh, address those things and provide access to everybody. That is a very difficult, uh, time-consuming thing, and we have achieved it. Other things that we do, we work uh, with a number of partners. There is uh, Conscious Capitalism. Rosh Sodia is the person on the left. Uh, he is the spiritual leader of conscious capitalism. And uh, we did a training sem seminar together in Monterrey, uh, Mexico, um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and we've created a conscious capitalism simulation. He came to Knoxville and asked to meet with us and, and have us create a, a simulation that would enable people to experience the challenges and rewards of managing a business that takes care of all stakeholders and not that is focused only on profit maximization. Uh, we also uh, publish a number of our simulations through Harvard Business Publishing. They just uh, requested two more of our simulations, venture strategy and international corporate management a week ago. And uh, we're really proud to work with them. Uh, if you look at uh, where Marketplace is, we're all over the world. In February, we crossed the million license uh, mark where a million students and business executives have included Marketplace as part of their educational training and business. And so if you take a look, uh, you can see all the places that we are. Uh, also, I do a lot of work with uh, in individual uh, countries. I've I work quite heavily in uh, in India recently. I used to do a lot of work in Central Europe as it was coming out of the uh, Soviet influence. Um, recently, I've been spending more time in India developing uh, entrepreneurial programs. And from their point of view, entrepreneurship is a way to lift uh, the the welfare and personal 
status of many people as they individually start businesses and then they add employees and it's for the great benefit of the country as a whole. Um, I'm doing a joint venture with some faculty in India and Kenya and uh, uh, and we're focusing on entrepreneurship development uh, with university students, local communities, women entrepreneurs in particular. And uh, so we're trying to develop uh, the capacity of, of people to become uh, entrepreneurs and to grow businesses. Uh, a couple of more points about marketplace. Uh, when the pandemic hit, we were all in a panic as to what would happen. At spring break, uh, we told our students at the University of Tennessee to, to go home and we would go online. And on the last day, I taught on the final day of the, before we went on spring break. And I told the class, I said, we will probably not see each other again face to face. And their faces got very long. And I, although I had done online teaching, not to the magnitude that became necessary. But with Marketplace, one of the things which we concluded is the classroom was nice, but it's no longer necessary. With meetings like we have here with Zoom, uh, people can work together. And I'm sure all of you have that experience now. With Marketplace, it is like a hub that connects everybody and that you may have different responsibilities. One of you could be doing marketing, another one production, another one finance and accounting, another one HR and so forth. And they can interface with each, with each other on Zoom and see each other and talk to each other as they deal with the issues and problems and opportunities in marketplace. And then also you, you as an instructor can log into that, those Zoom meetings and have uh, coaching sessions and also be able to look at everything. So that gives you a kind of a background. And uh, let me just pause, see if there's any questions or comments in the chat before we move on. Nothing so far. Okay. So we're going to play a few quarters and uh, I'm going to escape. And let's see if I can get this. Just right. Okay. So this is the uh, the marketplace software, um, and uh, let's see if I get this position in here just right. Um, so this is what you would see if you were to log in uh, to uh, marketplace, or your students were to log in. Uh, on the left hand side uh, is a task list, a menu of everything you're supposed to do from uh, top to bottom. And uh, uh, you're going to be starting up, uh, in this case, uh, this is an intro to marketing simulation. You're going to be starting up a new business. You'll create a new kind of bike shop, all right, that's different than anything that's come before. Uh, and that is because you're going to be able to use uh, uh, 3D printing and uh, be able to build bike frames with 3D printing and use a new economical form of carbon fiber. And these two technologies will enable you to print 3D uh, printed bicycles um, with uh, economical lightweight carbon fiber. And this will cause a, um, you to be able to create a new business. Uh, and uh, where in the past, you would have 50 to 100 bicycles on display um, you'll only need a handful and you'll have a showroom and the price point is substantially less. They, um, uh, where carbon fiber bikes cost a minimum of 5,000 to 10,000 to 15,000. And they're mostly for elite bikers. These bikes are now going to be within your reach. Um, so the target market is, uh, um, uh, still at the higher end of the conventional bike market but these bikes are gonna be much more affordable. Um, so you're gonna be creating a new division and uh, your success is gonna be measured based on your financial performance, your market performance and your marketing effectiveness. So let's just take a little bit more. So this is the world in which you compete. You're gonna, you have the opportunity to open up 
four test stores in four vastly different geographic markets around the world. Now, these are test stores. The idea is, is that you wanna see to what extent you can sell these bicycles in these markets, all right? Because people are not accustomed to being able to buy a carbon fiber bike. Even if it's a little bit pricey, they're not accustomed to buying one, they buy metal bikes. That's where we have all that experience. And there are three market segments, the recreation segment, mountain and speed. Uh, the recreation segment, as the name suggests, it's for people who are out to have a nice time with family or friends. They like to ride on paved bike trails. Uh, they're looking for uh, comfort, ease of use, a good time. Um, uh, and uh, they want safety. Uh, and they are th the most price sensitive among the three segments. The mountain segment is a little bit smaller uh, market. And these are for people who like to go off road. They like to get on the dirt trails. They, they're happy to struggle up the hills and go down the hills. They, they enjoy dodging the boulders in their path and the tree limbs and all these different things and the sharp curves. It's a challenge for them. And they need a bike that's very sturdy and rugged. And they'll pay extra for that kind of a bike. At the high end of the market is the speed segment. And these are people, as the name suggests, they like to go fast. They want an aerodynamic bike that's lightweight, all right, that's agile um, and has a touch of class. So these are the things they're looking for and they're willing to pay for it. Now we have an overview of the activities of everything that uh, will happen. So quarter one is to organize the division. And in this game, you are really a division for a larger uh, bicycle company that wants to test out this market. In other scenarios, you're, you are the startup company itself and you and your classmates will put up the investment money. But this one is where you are a division. And so it tells us what you have to do in quarter one, name the company, analyze the market, choose your initial target, segment, uh, you'll define market responsibilities and schedule the opening of one sales outlet. And then in quarter two, we're gonna go to test market. We'll design a brand, hire some salespeople, price it, design a small advertising campaign and plan the opening of a new store. And then in quarter three, we'll take a look and see how we did. Now we're gonna make these decisions jointly, okay? Um, so everybody here will have a vote as to what we're gonna do um, in most cases. In some cases, I'll make a, uh, a decision. So this is gonna be the SMS bike company. All right. And I could put a logo up there. I don't have quite the time to do that. So, but you can see this is our store and this is uh, who we are, SMS bike company. Now we're gonna look at the market research and uh, so uh, the, everything is self-contained within this simulation. Oh, incidentally, uh, it's divided up, each section is divided up into a lecture and a workspace. In the lecture, uh, we explain the managerial issues and, and uh, kinds of things to think about um, when you're making a decision. We'll give you decision tips and, and uh, some background information uh, of uh, you know, theory and scholarly type. And then in the works, workspace is where there is either information or decision to make. And so the first thing is we're trying to understand our market and develop a mental profile of the three segments. So these are all the things that are important uh, in this uh, market. And here are the three segments. And these numbers indicate how important they are. So for the recreation segment, easy to ride, comfortable, feel young at heart, safety, simple to use, they are the highest numbers, all right? That means this is where it lies to go after that segment. In the mountain segments, durable, handle rough terrain, ability to turn sharply, soften the impact of rough terrain, stop quickly, lightweight, okay, and so forth. Speed segment, speed, lightweight, aerodynamic, durable, they want navigation assistance. Uh, these bikes are about 
status and exclusivity and style and so forth. So these are the customer needs. And if you were to scroll down, you also get applications. So recreation, fun, relaxation, mountain, it's adventure, sport, exercise, and speed, sport, exercise, adventure. And there are graphs to show you the ranking of what's important. We also have information on the price willing to pay. So uh, they're willing to pay 900 for a station bike, uh, 1120 for a mountain bike and 1300 for a speed bike. All right, so again, what you wanna be doing is thinking about this as part of the profile of these three segments and then market potential. So looking out for the next uh, 12 months, what could the potential demand be? It doesn't mean to happen because for it to occur, you have to have the right brand at the right price with the right promotion, with the right stores, the right salespeople, a lot of things you gotta get right. But if you get those things right, these are the kinds of potentials. And you'll be making a decision on which segment to target and which city to open. And we're gonna, we're gonna use a democratic approach where everybody who's here will vote. And based on that, we'll be making these decisions. So the next decision is to select the target market. Now, there's a, a learning strategy that we use, and that is we always put the relevant information in front of the decision. So this is the most important decision they'll be making at this point, is do we want to make recreation our first priority, mountain our first priority, or speed? So I'm going to have Gary Lewis help us. Uh, Gary? So what I'm looking for are the people in the room who are participating in the conference. If you would type into chat your preference, which of these three, recreation, mountain, and speed, is your preference? Would you please uh, type in your uh, choices and Gary will tell us what the vote is. Gary? Yeah, we've actually, already got uh, a few coming in. It looks like we have two votes for recreation so far. Three votes for recreation so far, very popular. It looks like that recreation is going to win out, Dr. Kadat. Okay, so we will make uh, recreation our first priority and the other two are not gonna be our priority in the startup phase. All right, very good. So that's extremely important decision. Now we would normally put in responsibilities for each member of the team, but it's just me. Um, so now we have to decide which store to open. And again, I put the information in front of the decision. So just take a look at this uh, recreation segment. Amsterdam is the largest followed by Bangalore, New York and Rio. And if we look at open the stores, I choose modify. Uh, this is the quarterly lease cost if I open the store. Uh, New York is the most expensive, followed by Amsterdam, uh, and then Rio and Bangalore. So uh, if you would put in the chat, all right, what your preferences are uh, with regards to which city we should open our first store. And feel free to abbreviate if you'd like, everyone. We already have a vote in for Amsterdam. It's a very beautiful city. <laughs> a lot of consensus in this group. We have a lot of people that are wanting to go to Amsterdam. That's a good question. We uh, we have a clarification question. Um, yes. Are we able to command the same prices everywhere? Uh, yes, prices will be the same everywhere. You're dealing with a, uh, your target market is a bit upscale. And uh, so you'll be commanding the same price no matter where you are. Okay, Gary, so what do we have on the city? I think Amsterdam is going to win this one. Okay. 
So uh, we will have our first store in Amsterdam. So I, I can take a look and see what we've done. We've named the company, targeted uh, segments, and our first store is Amsterdam. So um, final check, no errors and warnings. I'm gonna submit and good. So uh, I have submitted my decisions and this little arrow here says, I'm ready to move right into quarter two. So uh, that, as you might have concluded, that only took a second, maybe two. Uh, it took me longer to figure it out than it did for it to happen. So in quarter uh, one, we organized the company and here are the things we're gonna do in quarter two. We're gonna design one brand to appeal to the recreation segment, set the selling price, hire sales and service people, open up a new store possibly for quarter three, design an advertisement and schedule the ad in the local media. So these, these are the things that we're gonna do. So we're gonna go down the task list over here on the left, brand management. Again, here are the customer needs. And if I order them from high to low, because we're gonna design a bicycle for the recreation segment. So we need to, deliver a design that will provide easy to ride, comfortable, feel young at heart, safety, simple to use, low price, it can carry things and lightweight. So these are the things which are important to them. So we're gonna design our first brand. Okay, and uh, uh, so I need to give this, we'll call it the SMS, fun uh, bike and uh, here are three different kinds of frames so this uh, the comfort frame is for the recreation segment but it ha had we gone for a mountain bike we would have chosen the rugged frame and you can see how it's changed and then the aerodynamic one if we were going the um, speed segment and in here are uh, feature options that we can have. So I'll go back to comfort. And uh, um, so there's certain base components like chains and, and uh, you know, the uh, um, uh, simple things that will go into a bicycle. Uh, the, we have the relaxed, comfortable design. I, when I put my cursor over it, you'll see that on the left here, things are described. We're going to use the standard carbon fiber. This is the first material that you have available to you. And uh, uh, new carbon fiber will be uh, available in a later quarter if you choose to uh, uh, develop that. Uh, I can have mountain tires, high grip. I can have hybrid road and off-road, and I can have racing. So this is your first decision. All right, if you would vote, should we have high grip tires, tires that are for both road and off-road, or should we have fast racing tires? So if you will put into the vote, which you would like to have. And we uh, already have uh, some questions coming in. Hybrid is very popular. Uh, Professor Living could ask, what do the numbers indicate? Uh, those indicate the cost for each component. So as an example where it says mountain high grip and says 20, that is indicating uh, how much it costs to produce that particular component. And up at the very top left, it'll say total component cost, which is currently 131, um, that shows how much all of the components together are costing. Right, and to that, uh, these are the things that are just going to go in or on the bicycle. You're going to have labor costs to produce it overhead. So this is the parts. Okay, so we have hybrid road and off road. Looks and, like yeah. uh, it looks like hybrid has won, uh, Dr. Kadat. Okay, all right. So we're going to look at brakes. You have standard brakes. It says standard brakes are the most basic brakes on the market. Precision brakes are engineered for better braking control, reduced weight, and good airflow. And standard disc brakes deliver superior stopping power 
in most weather conditions, disc brakes are heavier and more complicated to maintain than the other brake types. So of these three kinds of brakes, which one would you prefer? Standard, precision, or standard disc? And everyone is more than welcome to go ahead and vote. We have several coming in for standard so far. And I'm going to close this up in about five seconds. So we had a toss up between standard and precision, but it looks like standard has more votes. So we're going to go with standard. OK. All right. So we can have uh, moving on to handlebars. We could have basic straight. OK. Uh, they're relatively simple, narrow bars. They're designed for strength and control uh, on difficult surfaces, trains, and offer more maneuverability through tight pace, uh, spaces. Uh, they cause the rider to lean forward, which distributes the weight evenly and puts pressure, uh, less pressure on the seat. Comfort uh, handlebars um, have a small bend in the bar towards each hand grip that causes the rider to sit in a more upright position for casual riders. And this can make biking more comfortable. So uh, what do we choose? What's your we recommendation? Have, we actually have a unanimous vote for comfort already. Okay. All right. So now we're going to do gears. Seven speed uh, has one chain ring or gear on the front and seven speed set of gears on the back. It's sufficient for the flat or gentle rolling terrain in most cities. Uh, the 14 speed has two chain rings in the front and seven in the back. It offers a wide range of terrain and speed options, good for road biking, uh, but not for tough mountain. And then a 24 speed has three chain rings in the front, the bike uh, this bike allows the rider to ride comfortably at different speeds across varying terrains, okay? Um, and uh, with all this choice, the rider can find the best setup. So seven speed, 14 speed, or 24 speed. What's your vote? Uh, it looks like that we have a unanimous vote for uh, seven speed. Okay. Now the seat. A polymer gel all-purpose or a polymer gel comfort. So the all-purpose seat has a rubbery flesh-like consistency that provides good molding and shock absorption capabilities. The gel comfort uh, offers varying gel density for more relief and support as well as slats and grooves through the nose section, further increasing comfort. Which would we like? Everyone is going for comfort. I really like the, the bike that this group is building. I would prefer yeah. to ride this as a... <laughs> okay. Do we want to put reflectors on? Just say yes or no. They improve visibility from all directions, especially in low light. Looks like this is a unanimous yes as well. Okay. Do we want colorful, thin brushstroke decals? And they're designed to highlight the classy look of dark carbon fiber. So it kind of pops at you. Let's see. Uh, that one is also going to be a yes. OK. What about an attractive basket? It sits on the front end, um, small. Uh, you can hold small packages, water, uh, and things like that. Uh, let's see. We actually have a little bit of uh, back and forth on the basket here. One, two. We've got three no's for the basket. Okay. Yeah. No oh, wait. Mask. What? One, two, three. Yeah, we're going to have uh, no basket. No basket. Okay. How about a front shock absorbers? Uh, to soft, they're designed to soft the impact of rough terrain for a more comfortable ride. Easily adjustable for any weight and terrain. Yes or no? Uh, the, 
this is also a back and forth here. It looks like we have... Uh, the yeses are going to win out for the uh, suspension and shock absorbers. All right. Very good. So we have designed our first bicycle. All right. We're going to go to market this time. Now we have to price it. So the price willing to pay is about 900. All right. Um, the cost to produce them is going to be, if we only sell 100, it would be 351. It's not until we get to a thousand that we actually begin to see price breaks. Okay. Um, price and priority. So we, we will choose to sell this. Um, I have these quick links over here that can remind me of the price willing to pay. It's 900. So if you'll type in there two things uh, the price that we wanna put in, and you wanna put a rebate. Now I'll explain with the rebate. Typical rebates are 30 to $50 euros, whatever you would like to think of. And uh, uh, what's nice about rebates is they create price excitement, but only half the people actually cash them in. So if you put, let's say a 30 rebate in there, your net, price is going to be 15 less than the selling price, not the full 30. So what I need you to do is put in a price that you think we should sell it at. And if you want a rebate, how much would that rebate be? And so that everyone understands, uh, this is a good question. Uh, a question comes up, do we have any competitive information? At this point, Professor, the students do not. What they have is their initial market research. Uh, they will get competitive information, but not until after this quarter. So they'll be able to see the results of this quarter. Uh, it will be the first time that they can see what their competitors are uh, doing. But right now, everyone is only working with this initial market research data. So do we have, you know, it's, we don't know the students don't know if any of the other big bicycle companies are doing the same thing they're doing. Chances are they will be, but uh, they don't know much, they don't know anything about them. They're new people just like the students are. And this is another very good uh, question, Professor, uh, Professor Bartels. How limited is our supply capacity? For purpose of what we're doing today, not a not a concern that you should have. Uh, we have many different levels of the simulation. Um, some of them focus more heavily on the supply chain aspects of it. Some focus less. For the example that we're uh, using today, we chose one that uh, focuses a little less on it simply because it's uh, quicker to get through. So. Yeah, this is a marketing simulation, which is all about creating demand. The other simulations are full enterprise simulations where you have to worry about the supply and balancing supply and demand uh, and also worry about money and these kinds of things. So Gary, do we have a suggested retail price? We do have some coming in and I'm actually going to take the, uh, uh, so I'm gonna read these off to you. Uh, we have uh, 800 uh, okay. and you don't have to put, uh, uh, euros or anything out. We're just looking for the numbers for now, but thank you. We have 800 as one suggestion, 899 as one suggestion, and 399 as one suggestion. Now, I didn't mention the rebates there. This is just the retail price. So repeat those. We have 800, 899, and 399. Okay. Does anybody have a rebate? Uh, there was one recommendation for a rebate. That was the 399 had a suggested rebate of 49. Okay, so uh, a, a price in the 300s would be really, really low. We wouldn't have much of an opportunity to get anything back. So it's going to be between the 800 and the 899 without a rebate. And uh, uh, let's see, Barbara, are you in the audience? If, if if you are, give us your vote. 
No. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go with the uh, I'd go with the uh, more expensive one. Okay. Yeah, eight ninety nine. Okay. Oh, I well, see. Well, that one said euros, and the other one said eight ninety nine. Not sure, so I would go with eight ninety nine. Okay, we're gonna go with eight ninety nine. So now we're gonna see how I did, how we did. We use the balance scorecard to um, uh, see how we did, and. Uh, um, these are our competitors. I'll blow this up. Um, we are measured on financial performance, all right, market performance, and marketing effectiveness. And I like to look at the top two. So our financial performance is the highest. And if you look at total performance, uh, a lot of other people are higher. Uh, market performance performance, which is market share in our target segment. Um, okay, we're not doing very well. We're not doing well in marketing effectiveness, which is our advertising and our brand design. So um, uh, these are some areas where we would want to improve. And uh, I just want to point out too to everyone, because I got this question in a, uh, in a private message. As we're going through all of these results that the students are going to be able to use to begin uh, updating their decisions, keep in mind that different levels of the simulation uh, will have different results. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but if you're using a simulation that is more management strategy focused, supply chain focused, or something like that, the, the results in the balance scorecard will necessarily be different based on what uh, that simulation is focusing on. Again, this simulation is a very short one that we picked just because it's easier to show in this format. Right. And uh, so our company is SMS Bike Company. We're in the blue and our overall market share is 28%, 33% in the recreation segment. And uh, uh, down here, we can look at market demand. It turns out we have four competitors, all right? And uh, uh, if I, among the recreation segment, we're number two, all right? And total demand, we're also number two uh, with uh, 27%, but capacity bikes is 34%. Uh, in terms of our profitability, this is our revenue. We had, uh, this is our cost of goods, our gross profit. We had all these expenses, okay? Um, so all of this is computed for you and our operating profit was 12,000. I can see how many people they've hired. So SMS bikes hired six, two in service, four in recreation and uh, other bike companies hired five, all right, uh, or four. And uh, from the way they've uh, aligned their salespeople, I learn a lot about what segments they're targeting. Okay, so that is the overview of the simulation. And what the students would do is reflect on that new knowledge and, uh, um, figure out how to adjust their strategy and tactics. So uh, let's, all right. Just a few closing remarks and then we'll pause and, and have some conversation. Um, today, our challenge is to deliver quality education and, and we have to learn how to engage our students. There are so many distractions in normal times, the internet, uh, social media, cell phone, everything is fighting for their attention. We need something that will get them to put the cell phone down, pick their head up, pay attention, and engage. We need to challenge them. If, to engage them, we have to challenge them, where they have to think, they have to apply their knowledge, all right? They have to struggle, they have to have opportunities to succeed. We also need to inspire them. If we want people to think about strategic management in the way that you aspire to, all right, you need to give them things to realize just how important this is and what a difference it makes. 
all right? And that they've chosen the right profession. And finally, it's all about transforming students. And one of the things you'll see is how it changes in the life of your student from the first day to the last day when they are participating in a simulation. All right, they develop confidence to be a business person. And even though they know there's much more to learn, they realize they can do it. All right, and the final point is, if you would like to learn more, you can schedule a personal tour with our support staff. And Gary can type this into chat. Here's the important contact information at support at ilsworld.com. And here's the phone number. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there are any questions, comments, thoughts. If you can unmute everybody, please let anybody have a participation as they would like. Uh, Ernie, perhaps one question here from my side. Um, so I'm Diego Bartos. I, I, I'm, I'm not an academic, actually, I'm a practitioner. And I'm, I'm very curious about corporate education solutions in, in strategy, right? Um, I'm curious to hear from you. Um, how or if you guys have been applying this kind of solutions also on, on corporate academies, corporate universities, this kind of, you know, different uh, educational settings. Yeah, there, there's a, a number of companies that use like some of our more full bodied simulations for strategy. Um, they, uh, uh, they also look at using them for teamwork, leadership you know, business acumen and, and these kinds of things. And, uh, and for the people that we have often trained, they might, you know, they have come up through the ranks in a particular functional area and, uh, and they need to learn to be cross-functional um, and to consider, you know, how their decisions are impacting the company as a whole and others are impacting them. And so uh, this whole, uh, strategy, strategic management is very important. We do things like uh, have them make a pitch. So like in the first three quarters, they're learning the market. In the fourth quarter, uh, we have them prepare a tactical plan, uh, prepare a business plan or uh, some kind of a pitch. And, uh, and you can uh, do it where they uh, present to outside people. Like sometimes we'll have other executives come in and they will pitch their company to them and the executives will negotiate an investment, which is extremely powerful learning experience. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and, and so there's lots of opportunities to wrap lectures, discussions around this experience because they're all having the same kind of an experience. And, uh, and you can even have breakout groups we have uh, uh, a partner in uh, Great Britain that uh, they even uh, take like 30 minutes and they have each team reflect on what they can take away from this experience and apply within their own business. Mm -hmm. So yes, it can be done that way. Right, thanks. Yeah, I think one of the challenges that I, I used to place here, and so I work in the life sciences industry, and um, this is an industry that's very heavy on science, right? And we often, I lead the corporate strategy department here, and often we, we take scientists into our department too, right? And scientists often, they don't have the same business training as, as MBAs, for instance, do, right? So we yeah. actually... Uh, we often need to find solutions in how to train these people, even though they didn't come from 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 a, a business background, right? So, good to good to good to think about this and in, in, in terms of this kind of tools too. Thank you, Ernie. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, for scientists, engineers, you know, they have a particular focus uh, and they interface with the other parts of the business, but uh, they're still much more narrowly focused. And it's really helpful for them to understand the business side. And some of our uh, lower level simulations are just as powerful for them because all of these ideas are new. And, and, but I can tell you by the time they're done, they understand it because really business is very logical. Everything we teach uh, is 
as a result of experience and what managers need to know and be able to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, uh, great. Thanks so much, Ernie, for this. I actually just sent an email to set up a tour. I'm, I'm a huge fan of simulations. Uh, I use one in my course right now, that, and I'm kind of looking to expand that a little bit. One question I had, and I'm sure I'll get a lot of this answered on my individual tour, but from an assessment standpoint, what are some best practices you've seen to use this as actually to, to provide students with feedback, with grades, uh, with those kinds of things? I saw the balanced scoreboard, but is there like a one number that you know maybe we rank order students based on their performance or what kind of a, a assessment and feedback tools are, are in this uh, simulation? Right, so the balanced scorecard is the single best measure and it, you get a single number. So we combine in this game, market performance, marketing effectiveness and financial performance and you get a single number and they are rank ordered from high to low. We also compare them to our global standards so they can see what percentile they've achieved. And, and the, the drill down is also very good. So you get a, a top score and then you can drill down and find out where the causes of weaknesses are. Like in the company I just showed, uh, the ad designs are a weakness. And uh, so that's pulling down the marketing effectiveness and that also pulls down financial. So there's that aspect of it. Um, if you do things like executive briefings, we have rubrics for those so that like, at the University of Tennessee where I teach, uh, we meet with every team for like 20 minutes uh, a week where they review uh, their progress, uh, the, uh, how things have gone, their strengths and weaknesses and what they intend to do and what their projections are gonna be. And we measure them on depth of understanding, breadth of understanding and management by the numbers. So we have those rubrics that can be used in accreditation. And we have what's also called COLA, which is a customized online learning assessment. And that uses what's called situational awareness. And we can measure how much they know about what's going on in their industry, within their company, um, and how well they can anticipate where they're going. So we have really multiple measures plus peer evaluations and so forth. And I wanted to add to Professor that this may be a little bit outside of the scope of the question that you ask, but this is often a, a partner question that I get to that. You have a lot of tools as a uh, instructor to assess how the teams are doing. We have a built-in coaching assistant that will tell you exactly where teams are struggling. You have uh, the ability to view all of the students' results side by side. Uh, so if you do choose to use any of these other tools like the uh, the uh, breakout rooms or uh, executive briefings or anything like that, uh, you have a very easy way to tell where teams are struggling, why they're struggling there, because we give exact definitions uh, on why all of these things are happening. Um, all of this is built into the to the simulation. Great, that's helpful. It almost sounds like you're kind of like a board of directors and you're having the management team then report on a regular basis how they're doing and, and those kinds of things. I really like that, that kind of integration there. Yeah. yeah. In fact, you as the instructor coach take on the role of the chairperson of the board. And, and so they're, yeah, this is to simulate a staff meeting where they have to report to higher ups. Um, and, and the, uh, when, if you do a, a pitch, you know, that simulates any situation when you have to ask for resources, time, personnel, you know, and, and things like that, which is what we do all our lives. And then we have typically a report at the end where you have to give an accountability. So if, if you do this, you can have the same people come back and you can say, well, you've invested this amount in us and this is what we did with your money. And this is how we've made you richer or poorer as a result of our actions. Um, I also have a, have a question. Are there any technical requirements in terms of what, what's the setup on the student side? Does it run on sort of any device that has internet access? Yes. Uh, so you can use any of the um, internet providers that you would like. And, uh, uh, and just as I was doing, it's accessible anytime, anywhere. Uh, and uh, um, 
they don't have to download anything. It's it's all in the cloud. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I just have one quick question about cost. I couldn't find that anywhere on your on your website, but um, just an average price per student per semester. Okay. Well, though they are very. Um, off the top of my head, playing this particular simulation and against classmates might be 25 US dollars. Okay. Uh, if you, that's, excuse me, against the computer, against classmates, it might be 35. All right. We have uh, strategy simulations that start out, let's say, at 35. If you play against the computer, against classmates, it might be 45. The conscious capitalism simulation. If you're, if you, uh, if your school is putting emphasis on uh, impact, sustainability, ethical kinds of questions, multiple stakeholders, that's like fifty-five dollars. Uh, and then for the really sophisticated simulations like international corporate management, that might be eighty-five dollars. Okay, um, and so that would be uh, uh, when you go do a tour, you, you can get those prices. Okay, I see Barbara's here. She's probably here to tell me, Ernie, it's time to wrap up. And uh, it's uh, it's been my pleasure to uh, introduce Marketplace to all of you. I hope to meet you all in person uh, next year. I think Barbara told me it's in London, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thanks so much, Ernie. Great uh, presentation. And also, Gary and uh, Kelly, thank you so much. Okay, it's our pleasure.